Hey, it's episode 103, and today's August 28th, 2018, and you're listening to or maybe even watching Human Factors Cast. This is the third time we've done this intro and the second time we've recorded this podcast tonight, so let's go ahead and get into this thing. Welcome to Human Factors Cast, your weekly podcast for all things human factors, psychology, and design. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of Human Factors Cast. I'm your host, Nick Rome, joined today by my good friend and yours, Mr. Blake Arnstorf. Oh, hi, Nick. Oh, hi, Blake. <laughs> So this is uh, this is Blake and our my second rodeo tonight, uh, but we you know it's okay. We're here. We're talking. It's Blake a good is, time. Blake is back from the hospital bed. I'm going to try to recreate as much of this as I can. Recreate the magic we had. A the moment magic. Ago. The magic. The 14 minutes of audio that we lost. Yeah. <laughs> yes. So massive apologies to everybody this week. I was out sick once again. Sorry about that. And I hope my voice is you know digestible this week. Uh, but forgive me if it's not. I know it's a little bit nasally it's okay you're here we're here we're we're fine we're talking human factors we're doing it uh we got a lot to talk about today though we got uh, the 63 startups that y combinator talked about this week um fusion which is a collaborative collaborative robotic telepresence parasite you had me at parasite blake this is <laughs> this is gonna be a good one brain is focusing four times a second like i just tried to to do during this thing that i just read and then colorado is uh, installing some smart roads so that'll be really interesting to talk about and we'll be back to talk about all that right after this human factors cast strives to bring you the best in human factors chatter every week we pack news interviews reviews and overall fun conversations into each and every product that we put our seal of approval on but we can't do it without you you see the human factors cast network is 100 percent listener supported all the funds that go into running this show come from the listeners. That's why we're giving back to our supporters on Patreon, now more than ever. Pledges start at just $1 per month and include rewards like 24-7 access to our exclusive Human Factors Cast Slack channel, personalized professional reviews, and Human Factors Cast Infinite, a Patreon-only podcast where the topic is human factors, etc. We're always updating our rewards, so stop by patreon.com slash human factors cast to see what support level may be right for you. Thank you all. And remember, it depends. And just like that, we got three minutes of audio back. See, we're already right on track, Blake. So, okay. I want to know. I see I see this in the notes. And I'm going to try to pretend like I'm asking you for the first time. <laughs> it is the first time. What are you talking about? It is. Yeah. Let's not ruin the magic. All right. Oh, so goodness. I see this. And I hope this is because of me. Because last week on the show, I said, write things down for reasons why I will get into in just a moment. But apparently, you did too. Yeah. So I've been a long time advocate of like writing goals down and stuff like that. But I've gotten in the mode of putting it in my phone as a reminder or as a note. And, I, and over time, I've just like I'll dismiss reminders if they just like if I can't get to it right at the moment right. or I'll forget to go back and reread my notes or something like that. So I kind of took a tip out of your book and actually started writing it down. Whether you meant like physically writing it down or not, that's how I took it. Um, right. Yeah. And I've noticed that my my just time management overall has been a lot better, like tasks for work and things like that. I'm easier. I have a better time of tracking them because I'm able to like create, you know, lists of things or ideas for per project. And then also too like personal goals that I have for projects that I want to work on, uh, whether it's like putting, putting together pieces of my portfolio or recoding things. It's just it's a lot easier to be able to have something physical to look at. And also, too, I'm writing down, you know, my long term goals and seeing where I am kind of chipping away at that. So thank you for the wonderful tip last week. You're very welcome for that wonderful tip. And I'm glad you're benefiting from it. Uh, I'm I'm like I said, I was classically trained to, by my mentor. Uh, in grad school to write down everything, not just memos, notes, but also like research ideas. So if you have an idea, um, write it down. You can elaborate on things later, but don't don't lose that thread of uh, train of thought. Um, reason being, we had this moment last week on Human Factors Cast Infinite where we were doing our uh, audio commentary of Command and Control, which is this documentary. And um, 
we we were right in the middle of it and i just had this moment where i was exclaiming and i said whoa i remember what it is it's quite a moment uh, and so our patrons were were treated to that um and basically what i was trying to remember that entirety of that episode last week was that netflix has audio descriptions and they are pretty rad yeah because that was the ir- irony at the time right because we're watching netflix right. and you have the epiphany that it was about netflix yes yeah, so if you don't know these audio descriptions so what these are are expertly sort of inserted audio descriptions of what is going on on the television program that you are or movie that you're watching that is um surgically inserted as to not interfere with the dialogue so i have an example of this this is um Season one of Stranger Things where Mike is talking to his mom and dad about his Dungeons and Dragons campaign. And uh, here, just just take a listen. How was I supposed to know it was going to take 10 hours? You've been playing for 10 hours? He turns to the living room. Dad, don't you think that's one more? I think you should listen to your mother. He smacks a staticky TV. In the basement. Oh, I got it. Does the seven count? Was the seven? Did Mike see it? Then it doesn't count. The boys put on their jackets and backpacks. One with curly hair and a hat lifts a pizza box. Hey, guys. Does anyone want this? No. The other two boys go upstairs. So it's it's pretty cool. You can see the audio description kind of jumps in and says, in the basement. And then it talks about the, what they're doing, but not to interfere with the audio. And I love this because I can sit down and I can, you know, listen to audio programs or i can listen to video programs while i'm doing other things like work or podcast prep on my laptop and you know unless i hear something interesting i won't have to look up because i just know what's going on yeah it's pretty interesting to have put all that together and it's only for like select titles right now right right yeah one of the big challenges that uh, we've run into in our household is that the office is like a staple right we have that on all the time and it does not have these audio descriptions. And it's a lot of the times it's background noise for me because my partner is listening to it or watching it. And uh, while I know what's going on because I've seen it a million times, it would be nice to have that audio description because sometimes I forget. And, you know, another thing with this audio description is that oftentimes I'll sort of remember or, or notice something new because of the audio description, like, uh, like character names are a big one, right? You can imagine how something like this would be I- incredibly useful in a series like Game of Thrones where you might not necessarily know everybody's name. And if you had some audio descriptions, maybe you start to tie the two together a little bit more frequently. Exactly, yeah. Something like Game of Thrones would be super useful because even me, like I've watched the show and I've read the books and I've still gotten confused. And in this way, it's kind of almost reminding you of everything that's going on at once. Right. Or being able to help you draw those connections maybe that you're not seeing or hearing. Right, because you, you have to at least introduce the character because people won't be able to tell just from the voices a lot of the times. And maybe maybe visually impaired individuals who this is this is actually made for uh, as people who can't see and visually impaired individuals. So... Maybe, you know, they're more tuned in to sort of the differences, the idiosyncrasies in, in human voice. But I don't know, man. Like, I, I find this thing tremendously valuable, and I, I encourage all of our listeners to go out and try it at least. Yeah, I'm just glad you remembered it. It's a cool feature. I'll have to keep looking at it and checking out titles that have it. Yeah, for sure. All right, so let's get into a couple notes here. So we are giving away a free registration to this year's annual meeting in Philadelphia. We are going to be at Philadelphia. Uh, if you want to come and hang out with us, enter this contest. It's links in our show notes, uh, links links everywhere. There's a couple ways to enter. Um, fairly low cost of entry, too, if I do say so myself. It's just engaging with the podcast. Um, hey, you know what, Blake? We're on YouTube now. We are. <laughs> And uh, what I would encourage all of our audience uh, to do is to go and hit that like and subscribe button because honestly, guys, that helps us out. And this is, we mentioned at the top of the show, uh, we had audio problems. And so this is the second time I'm begging tonight. The first time was to no one. But uh, we need 100 subscribers on our YouTube channel to get the slash name Human Factors Cast. And we can't do that without you. So if you could go like and subscribe so that way you can help the show grow because we do grow from word of mouth. We actually had a couple of our listeners um, reach out to HFES, and that's how this partnership started. And uh, a couple of our listeners who just joined the Slack recently heard about the show from other people they know. So we can't do this without you. Um, And honestly, just spreading the word of mouth helps us more than you know. 
Yeah, it's a tremendous help to us. We enjoy like interacting with you guys through whatever medium it is. So if you're able to help help us out on YouTube and share it with some of your friends, we would really appreciate it. Um, okay, we're not going to beg anymore. but For but, sure. But uh, it would really help us out. All right. So like I mentioned, we are going to be at HFES. Uh, we got a booth. We're right by registration. Um, you know, come reach out, hang out with us. And, uh, you know, we got a lot of coverage coming out of that. It's going to be a busy week. It's going to be a great week. So much um, fun. Can't wait for Philly. <laughs> All right. So, Blake, you know what time it is, though? It's time for more music. That's right. It's the time of the show where we talk about Human Factors news. Uh, we got some We got some transportation in there this week, finally. We do. Lots we, of transportation. We got some transportation. We got some VR. We got some... What else we got? We have some surveying here. Uh, I don't know. We got we got some brain stuff. All right, Blake. Well, what do we got at first? So at first, we have 63 startups that launched at Y Combinator's uh, S18 demo on day one this week. And Nick and I are going to talk through all 63 of them. All 63 of them here and on the show. It's going to be a long show, so buckle in. No, we we, <laughs> we broke these out. We uh, we picked four each, and I figured that was enough for us to kind of talk about at surface level and, and kind of talk about the human factors implications of these. So why don't I go with one, and then you go with another one, and then we'll kind of just flip-flop back and forth. Let's How about do that? it. All right, let's, let's flip-flop through this thing. So Plexus is the first one I chose, and what Plexus is is this uh, low-cost, flexible glove for controlling augmented reality and virtual reality experiences. Go figure. I'd pick something like this, right? It's a silicone glove uh, secured by Velcro. It doesn't cover your hands or fingers entirely, so it shouldn't leave you super sweaty. Um, the tracking sensors grab the position of where the hands are in space, in the virtual space, via the magnetically attached tracker, and after calibrating a resting state of the user's fingers, individual sensors... Uh, communicate their position to the game's engine. So this is cool. Okay. Yeah, so we've had a little conversation about this before in our first podcast. Right. But now, so if you're watching the video on YouTube, and for those of you who are, I'll try and describe it the best I can, but there seems to be something on the back of the hand that's really controlling a lot of what's going on for right. this glove. That's a magnetically attached tracker. Yes. Now, <laughs> <laughs> now I get it after like not understanding what it might have been. Because I was worried it. about like counterbalancing or whatever might be going on, but it seems like that makes a lot of sense. That's pretty cool. That's it. So this is a really cool application for human factors because, as I've talked about on the show before the more sensory inputs that you can mask um to be more convincing the higher sort of resolution you can get with fidelity in terms of immersion and you know i'm not talking graphical fidelity here i'm talking um uh, physical fidelity i guess in this case so each one of these fingers has a um a strap on them to actually give you that force feedback and that's that's a higher fidelity than say like a rumble feature yeah, and that makes a lot of sense because I remember testing even like a joystick with this in a it was like an air traffic control task. But the ability of just feeling that little bit of feedback front in your hand that you had actually like completed a task changes the experience completely on completely. how you're doing anything, and it also can improve performance because somebody's more aware of where that threshold is between where things change and where like actions actually happen. So it's pretty cool. Right. All right. Why don't you get into your first one here? Yep. So the first one that I chose was Higa. A lot of the ones that I'm going to go through are really medical base. So by this, go figure. The, yeah. The, the startup is really monitoring thermal patterns inside of a breast tissue. So the startup Higa hopes that it can offer women a better and non-invasive method to detect breast cancer. So the company's wearable wearable device is called EVA. It can be placed under any kind of like sports bra or other uh, other kind of clothing that's similar. Uh, to fill gaps that the current screening technologies just aren't able to address. So things like early breast cancer detection in women and high breast density. Uh, the company's already actually pre-sold 5,000 units, which is kind of incredible, and they're going to keep shipping throughout fall 2018. So, Nick, this one actually has a little bit of kind of like a, a close-to-my-heart tie because I've, I've had family members that have had breast cancer, of course, and um, there's also the fact that my dad used to work in kind of these medical technologies like this that were dealing with the algorithms that allow you to detect like things going on in breast right. cancer screenings. So this is taking it to a new level. Now you're not worrying so much about machines or if you're getting regular checkups, you're using a wearable to actually help you detect what's going on in your body. Yeah, and who knows what kind of future this holds. I mean, we talked about on the show about a year ago, I think, was the fitness, Fitbit data that indicated that somebody was having like a – like a high blood pressure heart attack or something. Yeah, it was a predict or using to be a predicted cardiac events yeah. and stuff like that. So who knows what kind of technology? The fact that this is becoming more portable and more easily accessible to a wider range of people, that is great. 
because as this technology becomes smaller, more portable, more accessible, uh, less expensive, then we can sort of bring more health benefits to a wider audience. And I think it gets away from the model of like you're having to like ingest this is going to sound a little sci-fi but like ingest nanobots or having to have something that's stuck in you all the time. Maybe we can really right. integrate a lot more technology into clothes. Um like even business looking clothes that allow you to keep that smart snapshot of your health at all times. Sure, yeah, it's completely less invasive. So that's that's great too. All right, so I'm going to talk about I'm moving on here taken on via via opt i'm not sure how to say this it's either via opt or via opt i'm not sure uh, so this is in the united states trucks are moving goods across the country with roughly 35 percent of their available cargo space underutilized so via v opt see it's like spelled differently here anyway uh, a software company that aims to be an uber pool for shipping uh, thinks it has the solution uh, where they're taking sort of the 65% of underutilized capacity and filling it um, to save over $30 billion for companies and remove 100 million ton tons of carbon emissions by linking uh, small and medium-sized companies with this excess capacity. The company hopes to give small retailers the same logistics opportunities that were only available to the largest resellers. So this is pretty cool. It's such I, an awesome model. I remember reading this one now, and I almost picked it. I'm glad I didn't. I'm glad you didn't either, because this, to me, Human Factors Logistics is a whole can of worms that I I would kind of really love to dig into this kind of thing. Like, what kind of um, interface does this look like behind the scenes for people who are scheduling these shipments? And how do you present some sort of interface that, kind of gives you that heads up like hey this is under you're under under utilizing space and the pre the predictive or suggestive analytics that will say you could fill it with this or um you know this is going to the same area as this other thing so why don't you lump these things together or you know it, it's all really interesting to me and i wonder if there's anyone out there listening who's into this 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 sounds like a fun opportunity to combine so many different things we've talked about on the show from 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 it just being a fun multivariate problem to try and solve too, right? Right, because you're dealing with not only stuff stuff that's being stacked into a container that's being under underutilizing the space, and now you're trying to figure out how to fit more in there. So that deter that right. means you're going to figure out how to stack it in there, what order it needs to go in, what's coming out first, all that kind of stuff. And then there's e there could be even be the fun part that we've talked a little bit about um, in terms of like shipping ac shipping across to like different countries and the implementation of like blockchain technology to kind of yeah. help with that verification. But what if you could apply it to this too? So yeah. it's making some super automated process and to take it one more ridiculous step. If you're using, you know, some kind of augmented reality app to scan the inside of a truck when you have a couple of options of things you could fit inside of it. Yeah, that's, that's crazy. You, you're right. Spot on the money by combining all these technologies. It's going to be just a human factors dream to work on this kind of stuff. It really is. Now you got me excited about logistics. <laughs> um, All right, why don't you get into the next one there? Whoa. Yeah, uh, apologies. So, okay, this one is another kind of medically cited one, so it's called TOG. So TOG is a product that's now installed in four assisted living centers around the U.S. and is able to capture more accurately than actual caregivers at facilities changes in residents' health in general. So this includes sleep, their breathing, their bathroom visits, their regular movement speed, all the kind of things you want to keep track of as a normal caregiver. So the founders have been developing this home sensing product since about 2016. And given the explosion in the number of elderly in need of home care, it seems like Tog is a product hitting the market just at the right time. Now, Nick, it's something we don't talk about a whole lot on Human Factors Cast, but there is this entire field of like designing technology and human factors in general, designing for aging populations. And yeah. I think something like this is really hitting the nail on the head with it. So, Tog, uh, this is a system. What does this system look like? Do you know? It sounds like it is just a home sensing system. So it's trying to just pick up on what the person's doing throughout the day. I'm assuming implementing a fair amount of technological pieces throughout the home. Okay. So so probably like smart cameras, um, other various sensor technologies that will, like Fitbits, probably integrating with those in some capacity. Um that's what it sounds like to me, because there's got to be at least some component of something they're wearing, because we're talking about how's their sleep, their breathing. Going to the uh, bathroom. Yeah. 
and so the, it, it, it's got to be a combination of a fair amount of things. So it sounds a little bit a little bit invasive because you're going to have to add a bunch of technology into your home. Potentially, yeah. But at the same time, it's something that I I don't know I would have done for either one of my grandmothers if it made them feel like they could live it live their life at home and not right. have to have somebody always up under them. Yeah, yeah, no kidding. Like if as as long as sort of that that message is clear because I know uh, the older that that you get sort of the more technology adverse not always but just in, uh, there's a general trend there i mean yeah it's, it's a it depends situation but you're generally right i mean yeah. people don't like to learn more technology it's, as they get a little bit older especially the privacy thing right like it's I, maybe this is anecdotal i don't know but i know some older folks who maybe have problems with the privacy issue or younger folks they grow up with it and and they kind of understand that it's a it's a part of the changing way that we interact with technology and so that's one hurdle that i can kind of see but aside from that i think this is a great idea yeah i think it's a fun one just because it it adds a lot of cool aspects that we've been talking about so like maybe it integrates with fitbits but then also it's just acting as a as a way to another way to keep an eye on your health or health of a loved one and then transmit it to a doctor it's not like you're taking these like caregivers out of the right. kind of equation completely, but it's transmitting data. So maybe they know when they need to be there. Maybe there's certain times of night, it's better for them to be around. Sure. That kind yeah. of stuff. So it's cool. Hey Blake, I got another one for you. Another, another augmented reality one, man. I didn't even know you liked augmented reality. Oh, shut up. All Here right. So go. this is fire. Uh, I think P H I A R. Does that sound right? Yeah. Fire. Fair. Uh, This is building an augmented reality navigation app for driving that shows a driver exactly where to go without taking their eyes off the wheel. With an efficient AI fit into a smartphone, Fire uh, software can run at 200 frames per second on a dash-mounted iPhone. This is great. Um, With deep AI and computer vision expertise, plus a team of members from Apple, Microsoft, and VMware, Fire wants to build the killer AR application to address the 1.7 billion people who use a navigation app each month so this is kind of cool um i picked this because it's still a challenge right they're using existing technologies they're using the phone that you have in your pocket your iphone and sort of using this as an augmented reality piece and their whole mission is to kind of not take your eyes off the road but i'm i've i've got a lot of thoughts about this and i know we're trying to keep these things short so If you want my full thoughts, hit me up on Slack because I'm happy to talk about this at length. But let me just try to summarize. So, one, this hijacks the same distraction method. This this hijacks the same method by which you would be distracted Um, in a very similar fashion to we talked about Jackbox games on the show a while ago, where that hijacks your distraction method and forces you to interact with the party in a way that you can't go check something else. This is the very same way. If you want to navigate, you can't be on other apps on your phone. You have to have that up and looking at that very thing. But you're you're not solving the eyes off the road problem, at least because you're still viewing through a very small lens, at least on the iPhone. I don't know how they're, they're planning to do this. And that's kind of my, um, I love this. I don't know how this is going to work spiel. <laughs> Yeah, I would really love to try it because, I don't know, I like anything that's enhancing your ability to like have navigation directions because I still su- struggle with this now. I mean, I've gotten to the point where I basically only go by sound, but sometimes I need a little bit of visual indication, so I will look over to my phone that's right. mounted on my dash. And I think the the real winning aspect that they have here is for people like me who have an old car, right? I don't have anything that can integrate into the car that's got a screen or they, that would allow me to, like, throw a heads-up display in there. Right. So it's kind of a, a fun, like, modular idea. But I agree with you. I'm a little hesitant about the implementation and then... You're looking at the road through a lens. Yeah, you're, that's, and through a that's screen. what I'm afraid of. That's that's the danger, yeah. right? But some people swear by heads-up displays, so maybe this is just no, an no, no, extension not, of that. Don't get me wrong. I'm not knocking heads-up displays. I think heads-up displays are, they if they're done correctly, they can work really well. I'm knocking the small screen size of this and the fact that, um, you know, I I guess if, if it's, I don't know, you're, you're looking at the, you're looking at the road through a, through a screen on your phone that's run by a camera. And unless it kind of ah, hit me up on Slack, I'll, I'll be happy to talk about all that stuff with you. All right, Blake, what do you got up next? All right. So I actually picked a, a VR ish one. Yeah. Uh, but anyway, so I picked send reality. So send reality is looking to offer full 3d modeling for virtual walkthroughs of real estate listings. So the company sends photographers out to the listing with an iPad, a 
commodity depth sensor and specialized the specialized send reality app and these photographers just take hundreds or thousands of photos and send the send reality technology stitches stitches those photos together to create this complete kind of 3d model and for anybody that has seen the video or maybe we're able to show it right now you can tell like it looks very very real it's a little bit choppy and you can tell that it's being like integrated and stitched from photographs but at the same time i think it's a nice blend of both like the creativity aspects of taking photography and grabbing all the things in the scene and then blending it with technology so bringing the 3d model together allows you to have like a real nice peek into what your home could look like yeah this is cool so there's this uh there's this method called photogrammetry where you take a lot of pictures of an object and you create a digital model based on those pictures and this is kind of bringing it to the mass right yeah that's that's kind of what it's doing i i really like this idea and um you know maybe we can combine this with shipping methods <gasps> Ooh, we yeah look at that right. bringing that's it back pretty cool <laughs> nice <laughs> all right i want to get through a couple more of these i think my last one here is grab it um the inappropriate name but grab it uh turns a car's side rear window into a full color display uh playing location aware ads to anyone who might be standing curbside the product's designed for rideshare or delivery drivers enabling them to make a big bit of extra coin while doing the driving they're already doing as the driver crosses town the ads can automatically switch to focus on businesses nearby are you near the ballpark well it might pitch you a tickets for tonight's game over in the mission, you could play an ad about happy hour at the bar behind you. So this is very futuristic. Super futuristic. It reminds me of, I can't remember what film, kind of like The Fifth Element. Okay, yeah. This, where you're yeah. kind of just seeing ads everywhere like as you're driving by. Yeah, I'm, I'm not surprised that something like this is coming out, and I wanted to bring this to attention. So one, yes, this could make you a couple extra coin, but I'm thinking about the human factors of, of, of the other drivers right this could be very distracting and like i i just don't know like if you have a full color display how's that going to look like at night that's really distracting but at the same time that would make your car in which you are a driver an uber driver a lyft driver that would make your car more visible and less likely to get hit while you're carrying passengers so again of two minds on this I don't know. I worry about the distraction of other drivers a lot when I see I do. this. And, I, and maybe maybe in like urban areas, if you are kind of really targeting more just people walking on the street, it's not as big of a deal. But, right. I, but I feel like here in California, there's a lot of highways and a lot of time spent on highways. See, look, so let's think about this critically for a minute. So I can, like your point, I can imagine if you are driving in the rightmost lane, it would show, and going a certain speed, it would show the ad. Right. So that way, anyone who's walking on the street could see it. If you are in the middle lane or it detects cars around you, then it wouldn't display the ad. Right. So there's there's different conditions under which this thing plays. And it's very much like depending on how much screen time you have, um, that's how much they pay you because you could just leave the thing on. But if it's on a system where it's monitoring sort of what your surroundings are and could, um, you know, charge a rate that's that's kind of a. Uh, reduced for not having it on all the time, I feel like the advertisers, that's in their best interest, right? They don't want to have this thing up all the time because then people habituate to it. They don't look at it. But if you're driving at a slow pace and you're a sidewalk, then it just clicks on and has some smart monetary value to it. Yeah. I, I don't know. There's something wrong. Maybe there's something wrong with me, but I just... I feel like I have to deal with this kind of stuff all the time on the internet with the amount of like advertisements that you see. Okay. I, do, I don't know ad that blocker. I want to see a whole lot more of advertisements in the real world. <laughs> Just install an ad blocker into your into your brain and then... Uh, oh, yeah. There we go. That's the next startup. <laughs> all right. You got one more, right? Yes. So Allotrope Medical. So they've developed a electrical stimulation technology for smooth muscles that allow surgeons to identify critical tissue structures and distinguish functional from dysfunctional Uh, areas in both urological and gastrointestinal issues. So the Houston-based company is focused on initially decreasing the rate of injury during these types of surgeries. So again, this one, this one's not like super uncommon. Like we've heard of kind of electrical stimulation, trying to understand where there are dysfunctions inside of, you know, tissues in general, but it's just another fun way that you're seeing like startups implement technology that's already existing it's not necessarily brand new right um but to try and solve a specific problem in this case like injury rates in these specific kind of surgeries for both urological and gastrointestinal issues yeah i like this a whole lot it's it's fun 
Yeah, it's really cool. I'm loving these medical ones. <laughs> we spent about half the show on that, Blake. All right, so I just want to thank all of our friends over at TechCrunch and Spectrum IEEE and Gizmodo for all of our stories this week. If you guys want to follow along with these articles as we find them, you can follow us all over social media, and we also post them in our Slack channel where you can discuss these with other human factors practitioners and people who listen to the show. It's kind of cool. And you reach out to Nick and I directly, which yeah, is always fun. Yeah, yeah. All right, Blake, why don't we get into this next one here because I like this one a whole lot. Yeah, this makes you feel like grad school all over again. So the most, most of the telepresence robots that you can buy are appealing because they offer you some sort of mobile agency like the ability to remotely drive yourself around in a remote environment so robots like these encounter challenges when attempting to help others through collaborative tasks that require physical interaction so at Keio university in japan roboticist roboticist interesting have developed a new kind of telepresence ro- telepresence robot that's designed to as literally as possible allow you to remotely inhabit the body of someone else in order to assist them with manipulation tasks. The Kyo researchers called their system Fusion, and it lives on someone's back, allowing you to peek over their shoulder and use a second pair of arms to either show them how the tasks are done or to physically move their limbs for them. Okay. Pause for effect. That yeah. sounds amazing. Isn't that cool? I it's, can't. I can't. Now I remember kind of seeing the the robotic pack on the guy's back. Yeah. Okay. So let's kind of break this down for our audio listeners. So this is essentially a backpack with arms coming out of it and a camera. So that way you can either and, and you wear it on your back and somebody else controls the arms. So this is. The idea here is that you can use this to kind of show somebody procedural things in which you need to control their arms that would hook onto your arms and you could actually move their arms around or they can demonstrate how to do it, you know, in front of them with these robotic arms. So think about podcasting, for example. Let's say you don't want to lose a couple hours of audio. You basically show someone from behind the back how to do a podcast um, or you can control their arms and you know, they, they won't lose that hour of our audio. It was like 15 minutes, whatever. I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, this has so many wide-ranging implications. Expect, and it's kind of interesting to me, and maybe you have a different opinion, that this is really talking about telepresence. Because to yes. me, this is more so of just like kind of being an extra set of arms or legs inside of like a situation where somebody needs training or help in the task they're doing. Not so much like fostering the, the idea that they're in the same place. Right. Yeah. See, that's the thing I picked up from this was like, this would be incredibly useful with training or, um, you know, learning how to do these very procedural manual labor tasks uh, that require some finesse of some sort um, that somebody else can transfer their skills, their physical skills to you by showing you how to do it. And I think the telepresence piece of it is interesting because you are basically inhabiting somebody else's body. Uh, and it'd be like if I were to inhabit your body and teach you how to podcast and not lose 15 minutes of video. Uh, so, <laughs> no. Yeah. It's cool. You know, though, the context where this, I think, has such wide reaching implications, and maybe it would only be back in the day, but when we were watching Command and Control and doing the audio kind of commentary about it, I feel like that's a situation where if you have somebody that's far away, like at the Pentagon or somebody who created a technology, able to kind of run through test procedures that maybe aren't on the checklist. Or maybe like run diagnostic tests of like, okay, go, you've got to go do this thing on like the nuclear ship that's sitting out in the silo and try and fix it. Yeah. And this is a way to do it. That's a crazy application too. Yeah. Let's say you have some sort of skills and you just need a human body in the space. Yeah. You pay the minimum wage and then if shit hits the fan, you jump in and they just have to wear this backpack. Yeah, and you can kind of solve all of the problems or help them troubleshoot problems that they just don't have the knowledge to solve on their own. It's it's a really an interesting kind of concept, bringing robotics and telepresence and then also like the the way that they put it, being able to inhabit somebody else and manipulate their body is pretty interesting. I do, man. I just love the way this thing looks. It is it is wild, man, just having this thing on your back, like literally a, a, a camera looking over your shoulder um, interacting with... with uh, with the world. I don't know, man. It's it's uh it's a it's a crazy thing. <laughs> yeah, robotics have really taken off in a different direction than I ever thought they would. Yeah, like, especially with like the the aiding the human in a uh, complex environment type of thing versus just being like somebody that a uh, helper in the space. All right, what do you say we get into our next story? Let's do it. Okay. 
Sorry about that. All there right. You go. So, oh, <laughs> uh, I'm still sure. Okay. So, it's a brain. There uh, we yeah, go. Your brain is trying to change focus. My brain just can't focus today. Hey, All that's right. a nice segue. All right. So, new research suggests that your brain tries to change focus four times, might be more my, my case, per second. So, traditionally, neuroscientists have suggested that neurons fire in a consistent stream when you're focusing on one thing, while the new research suggests that instead, it has a kind of a rhythm where neurons become less active four times per second. During those those little blips, the research suggests that your brain visually checks your surroundings for something more important to pay attention to, like maybe something exceptionally threatening or interesting. Wow, so that, that's kind of taking the, well, at least my interpretation of what that last line means, kind of taking the reptilian brain into account, right? Yeah. So is there something in the environment I need to be scared of or pay attention to more than what I'm doing now. Right. You and I have both talked about evolutionary psychology on the show a little bit. And uh, yeah, I mean, it makes sense from an evolutionary standpoint, right? You're trying to sort of be aware of potential dangers that could come at you from any direction. And, and it makes sense that your brain, even while you're podcasting, is looking out the window, looking out the door to make sure no one's going to come in and be like, hey, you're too loud. Knock it off. Yeah, it's true. <laughs> the, so when I saw this story, I immediately jumped to my head speed reading. Because the only method that I know to speed read is to basically you're stopping your brain or not necessarily your brain. You're stopping your eye saccades from shifting too far off the page because your eyes like to move a lot even when you're just reading right to left. And so you'll basically put two parallel lines on the page to stop their, stop your gaze from going to the white parts of the page and it helps you enhance your speed reading over time, that is. Right. So that this is interesting that even even if you're able to like do something like that, your brain is still switching modes and checking for things in the environment even if you're not necessarily paying attention to it. Yeah, <clears throat> and I'm, uh, I'm wondering. So I guess maybe I might be giving away some sort of... Uh, thesis here he's giving so, away the secrets I'm giving, away, I'm giving away a thesis i'm giving away a thesis write this down uh <laughs> bringing it back so i'm wondering you know does this um have any sort of impact on state of flow if you were in a state of flow does is this still the case or does this alter when you're in fight or flight um i i mean i'd imagine that if you're in fight or flight you're very focus is getting away from that thing and so are you I, I guess yes you're still kind of looking around for external dangers but i'd imagine it's it's suppressed because you were just trying to get away and you're probably more susceptible to outside things likewise with flow you're very focused on one thing uh you're very focused on the task that you're doing and does that mean that you're still like looking up and away i don't know like these are these are good thesis questions, and if you're listening to the show, I just I gave you your your master's thesis. You're welcome. <laughs> there you go. We'll start raffling those off once a week. But it's it is an interesting problem, and I think there's a lot of variables that are going to play into it now too, especially with the amount that our amount that our brain is just distracted throughout the day. Even if you're focused on like doing work, I mean, between your phone, emails, you know, notifications on your laptop or your, anything that's going on. So I wonder how over time, if you're able to like put yourself in specific environments. That'll let you focus. Right. Yeah. I mean, how can, yeah, how can you basically hack this to improve your focus? That's why I like stories like these, because I feel like the more that you know about that, the more you're able to be aware of and try your best to try and put yourself in situations where you can maybe focus on the flow states. Or if you know you're going to be distracted, just understand you'll be distracted and be okay with it. All right. Yeah. The relationship between learning and um, ignorance, we're, we're here in San Diego, so if you're listening, there's planes overhead we usually record later so that's why the the relationship between learning and ignorance is interesting to me because the more you know the more ignorant you are about what is out there because you've just increased your sphere of knowledge and so the perimeter has grown which means you now don't know more about the things that you know now than you did previously when you didn't know that thing it's it's too meta for me. My brain's going to explode. <laughs> yeah, no, but, but you just learned true. that. So yeah. you just learned that. So now you know. Absolutely less than I did before. More, less, more. I know more, less, more. <laughs> it's a I'm, Tuesday, I know folks. more or less than I did before. You thought we were bad on Mondays. Here's a Tuesday for you. <laughs> yeah, you're going up on a Tuesday. Here we go. All right, let's get into this last story because I love this one. Oh, man, this is really cool. So this Thursday, a startup called Integrated Roadways plans to add its smart pavement to an intersection in an industrial corner of Denver. The company is encasing assorted electronics with four slabs of concrete and will wedge those four slabs into a road between a PepsiCo bottling company and two parking lots. 
So this smart pavement is said to be able to deduce the speed, weight, and direction of a vehicle from a basket of sensors buried in this pavement, which will face its first real-world test in this Denver Junction. The company can actually use this data to alert authorities to accidents or prompt officials to reconfigure lanes to relieve congestion. It's one approach to a so-called smart road, which will aim to contribute sensing and intelligence in ways that reduce hazards and hassles of vehicular travel. Okay. I really hope this works out very well in Denver because we need it here in California. Yeah, we do. I wonder I wonder if it would just illuminate that you can't fix the problem more than Maybe. help you actually fix the problem. But still, this is really awesome. They're throwing sensors. We've got it in our clothes. We've got it in our phones. Now we're putting it in the road. Yeah, so I, I'm thinking about sort of the applications of this, right? If you put this on a highway and you think about sort of the application, if you sense stop traffic, you can then merge. You can, if you had like embedded street lights above the thing, you could actually merge the lanes, give signals to people coming that way to let them know that, hey, there's something stopped here. So get in one of these other lanes, reducing the amount of stopped traffic near that thing. Um, alternatively, you could let them know if lanes are closed and, uh, you know, get them to merge sooner without actually having to put out cones or anything. Um, I don't know. There's there's just so much cool things that you could do monitoring the flow of traffic that, uh, like, like this article suggests, you can even call authorities if somebody's, like, stopped, right, on a highway, if there's a crash, if there's a fatal accident or something. Uh, call an ambulance once it detects a stopped vehicle. And depending on the severity of the traffic flow, then, um, you know, potentially routing – routing all the cars in one lane over so that way emergency vehicles can get to this thing. Like, I don't know. It, it's The applications are awesome, and I, I love this story. Honestly, I think we should cut the clip up of talking about this, of what you just said, and send it to them, because I just don't know that they are... Maybe they are. I'm sure that there's a lot of applications that they're planning to use this for. But right now in our article, it's talking mainly about the use of the authorities or reconfiguration. But what if you're able to kind of start pinging, you know, people's cell phones about traffic and it, it right. introduces the problem of distraction again but i mean being in the know when there when something's going on it starts to you know either feed into you know what you see on google maps or your ability to be in the right lane to help it, help the authorities get to where they need to be uh, i just feel like there's a lot of applications that data they're collecting are you ready for this I'm, uh, gonna... I'm not okay so you take your apple iphone taking it you, you put it on your dashboard you have augmented reality Yes. It's on your dashboard of your truck that is 100% full because of logistics. And then on the smart road, the smart road then routes you in the most efficient way that avoids traffic, that reduces congestion for all the other drivers, and uh, gets you to your destination safely. See? And it's all without automated cars. Man, you see what I did there? I love that. Yeah, you just that tied is, uh, it all together. You're only here on Human Factors Cast. I did. Do you have any other closing thoughts on this one, Blake? I want to make sure I uh, talk to you in full before we get to this next one. Uh, no, not really super interesting closing thoughts. I just think it's really interesting that they're just like basically taking a bunch of sensors and putting them in concrete. I know it's more complicated than that, but that's right. the way they kind of explain it, and that sounds really cool that you're able to deduce this much information that can be useful to yeah. other people just by putting sensors in concrete. Anyway, yeah. let's put more sensors in concrete, and it's time for that part of the show. It came from... It came from... That's right. It came from... Whoa, not Reddit this week. No. It came from the Slack. Check this out. We got we got a Slack uh, a, a thing this week. I don't even know what it's a Slack message, I guess. So this one... <laughs> So, well, first off, let's let's talk about what this part of the show is. This is where we talk about things that are relevant to you guys, the Human Factors community, as long as it encourages discussion and, and all that fun stuff. So, Blake, I had a listener reach out to us, um, or, or me specifically, I guess, in Slack and said, uh, Hey, Nick, I've been binge listening to your show. The episode on virtual environments or VR that you recommended was great. I really liked the episode on methods. I wanted to ask a quick question. After listening to episode 13 on ergonomics, from your experience, how do industry professionals view someone with a human factors background versus an ergonomics background? I've been thinking about how to best brand and position myself professionally, and I want to make sure I'm accurately portraying myself and my experience. Also, I think I might be a little lost on the difference between ergonomics and human factors in general. So, Blake, I gave her my two cents, and I want to hear your two cents before I jump in here. Sure. Um... I'm going to give some 
extra two cents. That extra I think, two cents. I, I love it. I think she should ask for. Definitely talk to Woodrow in our Slack. He's been on our podcast a few times, and I'm pretty sure he's still in the Slack, too. He's in the Slack. So you could always ask him about his perspective, because he has a much more ergonomic background that, than I, than definitely me, but I don't know about yourself, Dave. Yes, more than me, too. Yeah. He's our ergo expert. He's our ergo boy wonder. So if you really are interested in ergonomics <laughs> or its application and human factors kind of design or anything like that, definitely talk to Woodrow. He's got a lot of good experience. Um, in terms of, so I'm really going to focus on one part about the question. So I've been thinking about how to best brand slash position myself professionally. And I'm basically going to tell you that what, ask you a question in response to your question. So you may, probably just want to make sure you know what you want to do. Do you want to work with software? Do you want to work with physical products? Do you want to work in a space that's going to allow you to maybe do a lot, apply human factors methodology? Or do you want to really focus on kind of use cases of being able to physically use a product or design spaces which is much more of the ergonomics type of style of work um so i I think it's important to know what you want to do uh if you have like an h like a human factors background i think or an ergonomics background i think you can go either way you just have to be able to spin your experience or your knowledge that you have and i think it's obviously going to differ you're going to have some different methods if you've got an ergonomics toolkit versus just a straight human factors toolkit but at the same time if you want to be able to do both you just kind of talk about it in a specific way I love that answer. I'm going to back up one step Do and it. say to you, what is the difference between human factors and ergonomics? See, that gets really complicated for me. I'm not 100% sure, but this is my take on it because I've, I know in human factors when I've learned about it when I was in grad school, there was a lot that had to do with what's going on from like a I'm going to mess this word up. Anthropological standpoint. Anthropomorphic. Anthropomorphic standpoint, right? So Anthropometry, yeah. Like what's going on with your eye gaze? How big you have to design a space? Anthropometric. Anthropometric. There, there it is. is. We did it. Uh, we did it. Anyhow, so to me, and if I get this wrong, I get this wrong. I'm not really that worried about it. Um, you did it. I think it's much more related. When you're talking about ergonomics, for me, that has a lot more to do with kind of what's going on from a I'm going to do it again. Anthropometric standpoint. So this is what's going on in the workspace. Is it built to accommodate different sizes of people or the like min and max size of a person? And then two, it has a lot, there's a lot more intention in terms of physical design. Like when we're talking, when we're talking a little bit about, you know, can, can like the, is there affordances for being able to use a product? Um, does it like does it fit into not just the person's own ability to use use the product, but does it fit into their environment as a whole? I don't know, Nick. Really, what when you're thinking of human factors versus ergonomics, what is the like line that you use? You know, when I initially wrote her, I had something, but I at listening to you, I want to rephrase what I told her and say ergonomics is outside in and human factors is inside out. So ergonomics being your environment focused on the body focused on how the human interacts with the environment and the products in a physical sense and human factors is more of the cognitive piece of it how do how does the human mold or or how how do we mold sort of the software um or the interfaces to make it less cognitively tasking, whereas ergonomics is more physically tasking. I know that's oversimplifying it. And like you said, Blake, they overlap a lot. And, uh, uh, you know, one of the things I, I mentioned was that the um, the intersection is that th- there's a different tools used across both of these, but you still use a lot of the same methods. I mean, it's it's still designing for a human in some capacity and still looking at human needs and um, sort of optimizing human performance, be that cognitively or physically. And so just a matter of what tools you use, like the ergo side might use uh, a NIOSH workload analysis where, where you're looking at lift versus potentially a cognitive heuristic analysis. Like those to me, that's kind of the difference for me. Um, and I'm curious to see if you can pick apart any of that. No, that sounds about right to me. I, I do want to stress the overlapping nature of it, though, especially, I guess, yes. in my like grad school experience, because a lot of what I was working on had to do with the physical environment and the interplay between like the user within that physical environment. But a lot of it had to do also with the software, what's right. going on like from a cognitive perspective. So, But I definitely like your distinction there about the inside out versus the outside in. Now, there's one more point I want to address with this. So, so you kind of... Um 
you kind of talked to it a little bit, but it was the how do how do industry professionals view someone with a human factors background versus an ergonomics background? And you kind of touched on the how to brand or position yourself, and you were kind of lining this, uh, her up for um, sort of, uh, you know, make sure it's in line with what you want to do. And I, I basically said, you know, the way in which people view these, uh, these individuals, like I, if I were hiring for a job, I wouldn't look at sort of, uh, you know, whether or not they're human factors or ergonomics. I mean, obviously that, that you have a history of whatever, um, tools and methods and procedures you, you know, but in the end, you still have that, that same sort of driven mind to understand the user's needs. And ultimately that's, what's important to me. I don't know if you've had any sort of, uh, experience with, with the difference between human factors and ergonomics when it comes to, um, you know, how, how you view these industry professionals. I'm going to have to say no, man. I mean, the only time that I've, I've thought about it is, um, like there's specific, uh, startups or whatever that are really looking for people that are designing control, like control stations. Right. And there was like at one point, a project that I was working on that was really focused around designing this control station. And it was just something I didn't have in my wheelhouse. Cause I had never thought about, you know, what does the entire physical layout look like? Right. So that's, that's kind of where I would draw the difference between the two. But as far as like what industry is looking for, I mean, sure. If you have prior experience to that and you're designing some kind of like cockpit space or some kind of space, sure, yeah. they might favor one over the other. But at the same and time, it, you're like you said, you're using the same methodology and the same kind of user centric design basis. Yeah. And so I guess I want to, I want to add one more thing. Um, sort of early career professionals have no, uh, you don't have to worry about this problem because if you're looking for a job, you just need to spend that experience the way that you spend it, right? And and make it apl- applicable for whatever you're going for. Um, now, if you have like a long history and you can become incredibly specialized, then yes, people might seek you out for that skill that you have in that specific area, and it might not transfer over to something else. Where I mean, it could still transfer, but y- you know, you couldn't become an, like an ergonomic specialist on a keyboard. Um, layouts or whatever for you know making it more ergonomically sound or whatever yeah I don't know you can't do that and then transfer that to being like a like a a, a vision expert on distance perception in virtual environments I don't know like those those are two wildly different things uh, and you'd have to build up your skills back to that point this is this is I'm talking towards early career professionals I mean people who've been in the field know this but I, I feel like that's that's worth saying. Yeah, I think that makes a lot of sense. And hopefully that points you in the right direction. And if not, you can always reach out to us more on Slack and we're happy to dig a little deeper. Happy to clarify. And if anyone else is listening and wants a clarification on that, let us know too. All right. Well, that's going to be it for today. It has been a long Tuesday, that's for sure. <laughs> be sure to enter that contest. We're uh, we're going until uh, mid of September and uh, links are everywhere. If you guys like our stories this week, let us know. We're happy to uh, to talk about those as well. If you're a Patreon supporter. We got an after show coming for you sometime soon. Maybe not today. It's a Tuesday after all, you know. For the rest of you, you can join the discussion on our Slack or follow us all over social media. We're on LinkedIn, Facebook, or Twitter at H Factors Podcast. Be sure to drop us a comment on our SoundCloud. Send us an email at humanfactorscast at gmail.com if you want to know the difference between ergonomics and human factors. Be sure to like, subscribe, review us on Apple Podcasts, Google Play Store, or whatever your favorite podcast directory is. Leave us a voicemail at 901-646-1432. That's 901-646-1HFC. And, of course, uh, if you want to join the After Show Party, you can support us on our Patreon at patreon.com slash humanfactorscast. And, of course, of course, you can always reach us at our home on the web, humanfactorscast.com. Mr. Blake Arnstorf, thank you for coming back on a Tuesday. And... Uh, breaking all these news stories down with me even though you're a little under the weather we made it it's good we did it where can our listeners find you if they want to they want to talk about uh, some of this some of this cool stuff that we so, talked about some today. of this fun cool. banter you guys can always find me in the human factors cast slack but if you're looking for me on social media i'm at don't panic ux all the places as for me i've been your host nick rome you can find me across social media at nick underscore rome thanks again guys for tuning into human factors cast and until next time it depends, it depends. If we have technical difficulties or not, technical difficulties.